Hello YouTubers, today's video is a look at Grissom Air Force Base Museum just north of Kokomo, Indiana. This particular video is very special to me. Even though this base is now a Joint Air National Guard station, Grissom Air Force Base was where I was assigned after my last tour in Southeast Asia in 1973. This is also where I completed my enlistment and was released from active duty. Over the last few years, we have driven past Grissom Air National Guard Base on our way to and from Florida. Up until this year, we would make Kokomo, Indiana our first stop down and our last stop going back to Michigan. Kokomo is where we spent our overnight stay at the local Cracker Barrel. I had often said, and we had often talked about, st stopping at Grissom just to tour through the museum. And then during 2020, of course, that was impossible because of the COVID-19 restrictions. This year, we decided to take the time and stop and see if we could go through the museum if it was open. When we called to check to see if they had RV parking, we were quite surprised to find out that they were also a Harvest Host location. That cemented our decision and we decided to drive there on Wednesday night, stay overnight on the base, and then tour the museum on Thursday. Since Harvest Host discourages the practice of staying more than one night in any one location, we decided to stay there on Wednesday night, go through the museum on Thursday, and then Thursday afternoon drive back to Kokomo, Indiana, which is only about 10, 15 miles, stay in the Cracker Barrel Thursday night, and then return to Michigan on Friday. With that plan in place, we're on our way to the Grissom Air Force Base Museum in Bunker Hill, Indiana. The base is right on I-65 and is very hard to miss as it's very well marked. Turn left on West Hoover Boulevard. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, so I had butterflies in my stomach as I pulled into the parking lot. When we called, they said just to pull right into the parking lot between the A6 and the museum and park anywhere we like, preferably parallel to the plane. This is the Rockwell Navy T2C that we were fortunate enough to park next to and spend the night. This is actually right in uh, next to the parking lot uh, for the Grissom Aircraft Museum. This is from the parking lot fence. You can see the F4 that's right behind us. And of course, my dear, most beloved aircraft, the KC-135A. I spent four years flying on one of those. Three tours over in Southeast Asia, Guam, Okinawa, the Philippines, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam. Not to mention, while I was here, I did alert tours up at Goose Bay, Labrador. 
Grissom Air Force Base obviously is named after Virgil Griffin, Grissom, one of our astronauts. This was part of the 319th Fighter Squadron, 305th Bomb Wing, which I was part of, and the 433rd, or I'm sorry, 434th Air Refueling Wing. They also had some EC-135s, which were flying command post. Like this lot, by the way, is part of Harvest Host. So you travelers, if you're going down 65, either north or south, to or from Indianapolis, or near Kokomo, this is a place to stay at night. Now we have been staying at uh, Cracker Barrel in Kokomo, which is one of our favorite spots. But this is a new one for us. And we will be staying here more frequently. Some people like the water views. This does it for me. I couldn't be any happier staying in this spot. of the museum are from 10 to 4 so we're kind of getting ready to make our entrance unfortunately it's a little cool out it's sunny but our temperature right now is in the mid 30s when the museum opened at 10 we met with the director Tom Jennings since we were the only two people in there besides him, we were fortunate enough to have a personal guided tour throughout the inside of the building. This is the BA-53 thermonuclear bomb. Deactivated, of course. This particular trainer for the A4 is being refurbished with flight simulator computers. UH-1 Huey helicopter. This is the mock-up. It actually is a helicopter, but it was dismantled and made available for guests. My uniform in Southeast Asia was pretty much like this, only all green. That was the same rank of the Sergeant E4. Since then, they've changed it back to terminology as uh, Airman First Class. Model of the KC-135. If you haven't guessed it, I'm all partial to that aircraft. There's the A-10. Helmet very much like what I used to have. Only mine was white. Security police uniforms. They had both law enforcement and security. That's the cockpit of a KC-135. Crew entering through the Kalinka hatch. Gus Grissom. Ed White. Roger B. Shaffey. All three of them died in an accident. One there. Capsule. What can you tell me about the B-58? The B-58? Yeah. Well, to kind of give you a rundown, you know, it's a two-tank system. So this is strictly all fuel, and this is what you would have your, your bomb in, your thermonuclear bomb. And then it also has uh, four bombs that you can have under, you know, the wings and such. Uh, flies Mach 2, uh, usually between a 50,000 to 70,000 feet in the air. Um, they have, you know, three people. You got your pilot, you got your uh, bomb navigator, and you got your uh, defense systems operator in the back. And uh, uh, 
they're also in an enclosed capsule that you have up front over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you eject, it ejects the whole thing. Uh, and mainly that's because the speed and the height that it goes. So right. uh, it's pretty self-contained. Um, again, traveling Mach 2, uh, they've won several trophies for speed. Greece Lightning is the kind of the more famous one, as you see on this kind of mock-up. Mm -hmm. Flew from London or Tokyo to London in about eight hours, 35 minutes, a little over 8,000 miles. Uh, only slowed down five times to refuel. And the actual Greece Lightning is in um, uh, the SAC Museum in Nebraska. And, uh, you know, it's just a very special aircraft. It only uh, was in service for about uh, 10 years here. And um, Little Rock, well, it started at Carswell, went to right. Little Rock. But um, never really saw war, uh, but it was designed to be a deterrent to war. Russians were afraid of it, you know, and because uh, they didn't have anything that could catch it, shoot it out of the air or anything. And when they did the Operation Grease Lightning, they kind of demonstrated to um, them that, uh, you know, we can move our planes at the drop of a hat in a very fast manner. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Sid Kubesh uh, told me one time, he said, when, when they were flying, they were flying so fast, at times the wings were blowing red, they thought we're gonna melt right off. Um, and so the average speed was factored about 938 miles an hour, you know. Uh, so in, in Mach 2 is about just under 1,400 miles an hour. So they were they were hauling. And he says the only time they slowed down was to refuel, and then they sped up and kept moving. Yeah, the B-52s had to be flow, you know, slow down to be refueled as well. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember that because, you know, I remember flying along doing refuel missions and on the F-4, you know, that was fine. You, you, you never knew they were even being hooked up. They would tap me on the shoulder and say, okay, we're gonna refuel or whatever. Yeah. And so I'd have to hook up to oxygen, put my, sh you know, shoot on, I'd just sit there and then they'd come around, I'd take a little nap or whatever. Sure. They'd come around, tap me, says, okay, chief, we're done. Uh -huh. And so B-52 is a different story. You know, they hooked up, you felt it, it, it was like a jolt. Wow. You know, and then, of course, when they let, you know, when they disconnected, it wasn't so bad, but. Mm -hmm. Now, wasn't there a problem structurally with the B-58? It was very temperamental. One of the thing is uh, the uh, distribution of weight was a problem. Yeah. You know, if you didn't have it just so, uh, like if it was sitting on the ground and you were refueling it, it would end up nose in the air and tail on the ground. You know, so you never wanted to have that. Yeah. But I do have photos of that happening. <laughs> that happened a lot on 135s if yeah. they were going to reef them. That's why they had to have the tail, the uh, tail strut underneath the bottom of it. You know, yep. because I've seen where guys have actually, yeah. you know, they didn't have the strut in there, or else they filled up the aft body and the upper decks too soon. Yeah. You know, and not do anything with the center wing or the forward, uh, yep. you know, the upper deck or the forward. Uh, um, tank or you know the center wing tanks and the thing would just tip right up so oh, sure but I thought there was some sort of an issue too where they had a crack or whatever they would crack they they would crack um, and it and there was also problems with some of the wings mainly because of the fact the wings if I remember correctly how they described it to me it was kind of more of a honeycomb style design mm -hmm. so it was you know very Thin, You're right. But it was, you know, that honeycomb design, you know, was not the, I guess, not the best. Yeah. Well, um, the SR-71 had that same kind of a design, that honeycomb, gotcha. and it was very touchy. I mean, you yeah. can actually press, you know, you can damage the wing just by pressing on it. Yeah. And that would affect it aerodynamically. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. Um, let's see, what else about this? Um, was interesting, we had, when we were doing a tour with a um, elementary school, it was a fifth grader that asked the question. It was very, when you, when you go out and look at the plane, look at the front, the nose gear, mm -hmm. okay? The way the nose gear is, 
um, one of the students asked, he said, how does the nose gear retract? Because the tank is in the way. You know, the bottom tank, you know, comes about right in here, and this is where your nose gear is at. Right. And so it, it was a great question for someone this young, because we've never had anyone else ask that. But the way they reversed engineered, I guess, the way that articulated arm retracted was pretty interesting. The thing that really gets us as well is when they talk about the size of the wheels on the aircraft. Uh, they're kind of small, uh, but a lot of that is if when you look at the size of that, there's not a lot of room, you know, so they can't have big wheels. And apparently they've gone through a ton of wheels just on landing. You know, as soon as they hit, they pop wheels. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they, they said that when they got rid of the 58s over here, um, they had a hanger full of tires that they just <laughs> got rid of. And it's like, yeah. man, if anything we would have collected, that would have been it. Because yeah. I, I need to replace them, and you, know, you can't hardly find them. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a, a fascinating plane. And when you talk to people that lived in the area or served over here during the time, two things they talk about is the glow of the afterburners when it takes off. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the sound that it makes when it's flying and it hits that sonic boom. So those are two things that they love to talk about. Mm -hmm. They always hated having to replace windows at times, but at their homes. But oh. Uh, oh yeah, my gosh. I think somebody was telling me when um, uh, it was an old uh, uh, security police uh, officer that was here in the early 60s was saying that when they first got in and people were complaining about it uh, and the planes were all taken off on alert, someone would drive around the area just to check to see if there's any issues with broken glass. <laughs> it's like, man, that's something yeah. else. Spent a lot of time in one of those vehicles too, the alert truck. Yeah. Yeah. I it would is. love to be able to find one of those. Oh, yeah. You know, just to, just to put out, especially once we do the building, I would yeah. love to have something like yeah. that. Yeah, we we also had uh, they were like bread trucks, and yeah. then, you know, and it was it was funny because I mean you know you've got the klaxon up there you know yeah. with the like you know and the, the one on the left used to always flash. Um, that was like at different intersections, and whenever there was alert. Yep. That thing would be flashing along, you know, and you'd yep. hear it, mm -hmm. and everybody had to get out of the way because we were being called on alert. Of course, it's just yep. like firefighters. You had to be someplace. If yep. you went someplace, you all went together. Sure. You know, to be in the same vehicle and yep. that stuff. And that was, that was the closest thing to it, like a, they call them quite cold threes or whatever, yeah. where everybody's in a vehicle and they're all, you know, you know yep. didn't have sirens, but that was, that was pretty cool. So. Absolutely. It was funny when we were, my old base at Wordsmith up in uh, Michigan, you know, we went up there one year, and of course the base has been closed down. Sure. And we drove right out to the mole hole. Right. I thought, this is unbelievable. This is just, it was so strange just to be able to drive out there and actually park our vehicle right next to where you used to have to go in, and that was all restricted. Wow. This was yeah. very strange last night, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is really cool, so. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it. I mean, well, it was fun being here last night. Yeah. Well, one of the, the pilots, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sid Kubesh, this blue flight suit right here with the two tags on, that is his uh, flight suit. Uh -huh. Yep, and uh, he, he donated that to us, so that whole outfit is his. The one that says Grey Goat, that is Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Anderson. He was a pilot, mm -hmm. uh, and he's the last one that flew the Grease Lightning out to uh, the uh, uh, SAC Museum. Oh, yeah, out the office, yeah. And uh, Jerry Anderson told me an interesting story about getting into the B-58 program. Now, Jerry is like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, uh, size 13 shoe and he, he comes up to me he says you know he says you know how you got to be in the program I said no how he said you had to get in the capsule 
and uh, you had to walk away without broken toes. And I'm looking at him, and it's like, what do you mean? He said, well, again, I got size 13 shoes. He said uh, a friend of his who was in the program, his toes didn't get back all the way like they were supposed to. And when the shroud came down, it busted his toes. Hmm. And he said, well, I really want to be in the program, and I don't want to get broken toes. So he goes down, and he gets a size 11 or 12 shoes, crams his feet into him. He said it was terrible walk, and he said, but got in the capsule. Uh, the the ends of the shoes were all scuffed up. He said, but I had no broken toes. I was in. Oh, my <laughs> Maintenance. Uh, guys that come through your end mm -hmm. even. And when they're with their uh, kids or grandkids, you know, they start going through and they start talking about the different parts and pieces and what they worked on and some of the things that they did. And it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. See, I originally wanted to be a jet engine mechanic yeah. when I went in. And then I don't recall if they didn't have a slot or what the deal was, but they made me a jet, a jet aircraft mechanic. Uh -huh. Which is either 43151 E or 43171 E was aircraft maintenance specialist jet over two. So, mm. and because uh, most of the stuff I did around the engines was, you know, inspection, looking for leaks and, oh, sure. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we'd go around the inlet and we check the fans for uh, cracks. Yeah. You know, we're always looking around at the, you know, at the rivets. And we had one guy over in Southeast Asia, like I said earlier, we had, you know, we uh, crewed um, Razorbacks, which was, we flew um, radio relay missions between the Navy fighters and the aircraft carriers because they didn't have the radio technology that they have right, you know, that they have now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the guys, he just decked out and he polished is the um, uh, the inlet a real high? He just polished it and made it really shine. Mm -hmm. And any place where there was real, you know, the bright metal, he would polish that up. And then he changed all the carpeting on the inside of the aircraft. Oh my! And then there's 30 radials along the right side bulkhead, mm -hmm. and he painted that all up. And then he put plexiglass with pictures. And some of the pictures, I wouldn't say they're family friendly, oh, okay. <laughs> you know. But and then he had them under plexiglass. People just loved that. Oh, you yeah. know, they thought that was great. So, absolutely. But, and the fan, funny thing is, is a big engine like this, three bolts holds it up. Really? Yep. Interesting. Yep. You have a mount right up here. Yeah. That's one of the mounts. Yeah. And then, I'm trying to remember. Where the other mount is. Oh shoot, I can't recall. And then these things, they used to have, uh, they were water injected. Yeah. When you had heavy fuel loads. Yeah. And people say, well, you know, we'd say we have to burn water. What do you mean burn water? <laughs> well, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. As they'd inject the water in through the ports. Yeah. And that increased the, you know, the thrust. Yeah. And so it was a one time thing. But when the weather got cold, uh, we'd have to go out and heat water so it wouldn't freeze. And I oh, think wow. the tanks on the 135s were like about 640 mm -hmm. gallons, something like that. Wow. Man, all this stuff is coming back to my memory. It's funny. A old guy like me, I can still remember this <laughs> stuff. Marine, and he uh, was a helicopter pilot. And he also was with the state police. So we flew the helicopter for the state Mm -hmm. For the governor, if he had to shuttle him around and such, so he uh, he was very uh, much in love with the helicopter. Loved the year. He said, "Is he said they could be smoking like anything, but as long as they weren't burning any oil or leaking it out, they flew." <laughs> he says, "Not with the, a lot of the newer ones like the Apache and all that." He says. Sensor goes out, they're grounded. Not the you. Yeah. So this is a mock-up of a, one of the Thunderbirds. Yeah. 
we we did that um, Norton before it, it didn't have all the Thunderbird stuff. It was just F-16. Um, but when we had uh, when they had the uh, air show across the street uh, in 2019, uh, we we did it up with uh, Thunderbird's uh, logo. And then we had a former Thunderbird pilot who lives in Noblesville, about, and uh, he uh, came up here, did a talk, talked about some of the objects. Yeah, Matt Modleski is his name. And uh, some of the videos he showed when he was a pilot uh, with the Thunderbirds. Uh, Inside the cockpit of an F-4. Navigator seat in the cockpit of an F4. Gauges are all simulated. There's your stick. Pilot seat of the F-4 Phantom. It's your flight stick. This here is for your flaps, throttles. Landing gear. I believe it's here, I don't recall right offhand. I'm not that familiar with the F4, but usually there is a knob on the stick for the landing gear, and it's shaped like a wheel. Again, my apologies, I'm not that familiar with the cockpit of an F4. I was trained on the 135 and the B52, so those I could tell you a little more, give you a little bit more information. This has been up since uh, last March. Uh, we opened it up and it was probably about two weeks when uh, the state closed us down. Huh. And it reopened uh, June 14th and, um, you know, when we did open, it's like, you know, like every place, it was just very uh, sparse with visitors last year, so. Purple Heart Trail. <laughs> this is the Boeing B 47B. That'd be the predecessor to the B 52. This is a Grumman C1A. It's 
the naval, naval you know, aircraft. Often used for fighters, a small transport. That back there, underneath the wing, it's called an MD-3. That's a portable generator. That's what gives power to the aircraft when it's parked. You used to have to stand fire guard on that when my early years. First air refuelers, which was a KC-97. This is before they went to jet, because it's KC-135. This particular aircraft, the receiving, or receiving aircraft had to slow down. Fairchild C-119G, that's a cargo plane. KC indicates that it's fuel that it carries fuel. C indicates it's general cargo. F is fighter. B for bomber. So on and so forth. C-47. Commonly used as either a transport or just general cargo. B-25 Probably one of the most famous aircraft during World War II Why? This is what flew over and bombed Tokyo B-58 came after the B-52s and replaced by the same aircraft.
F-100. This is the first jet aircraft I remember seeing as a kid. Bell Aircraft, UH, 1HBF. It's a Huey. This is the aircraft that was most popular in Vietnam. Now, this happens to be an EC-135L. This particular aircraft was more as a flying command post. They called it, it was part of Operation Looking Glass. They had several of them here when I was stationed here in 1974. The EC-135 Looking Glass is a highly modified command post and communications relay variant of Boeing's family of C-135 straddle, straddle lifters. KC-135 straddle tanker family. Operation Looking Glass provided at least 11 EC-135s to the Command Editor-in-Chief and Strategic Air Command, SAC, stationed at multiple bases, Bristol Air Force Base Man 1. The U.S. nuclear strategies depended on its ability to command, control, and communicate with its nuclear forces under all conditions. An essential element of this ability was looking glass. Its crew and staff ensured there was always an aircraft ready to direct bombers and missiles from the air, destroyed or rendered inoperable. Looking glass was intended to guarantee that U.S. strategic forces would act only in the manner dedicated to the President. SAC began the Looking Glass mission on 3 February 1961, and Looking Glass aircraft were continuously airborne 24 hours a day for over 29 years, accumulating more than 281,000 accident-free flying hours. On July 24, 1990, the Glass ceased continuous airborne alert, but remained on the ground alert 24 hours a day until the deactivation of SAC on June 1st, 1992. These are the J57 engines. where the boom pod is. Panels back here are for flex. That's that's the refueling uh, that's the boom. And then that extends out with the nozzle or coupler. APU inlet cabin air and out turbine air that was your predecessor to your onboard generators to your class A's and class B's class C's they were using this in the 60s wheel well here the door drops down and that's where the panel is to do the refueling while it's on the ground now 
there is long panels down here, these black panels. And what those are is they're light panels. They have different colored lights. There's one on each side of the aircraft and it's to give the aircraft being refueled signals as far as which way to go left, right, up, down if needed. Also, it'll tell him or her nowadays when to connect and disconnect. Just antennas on the bottom. Static electric discharge poles because it does get with the airflow a lot of electricity built up on the inside. Door for the crew entry hatch. This is the crew entry hatch. And then every crew chief, including myself, put their name on the aircraft as well as the assistant crew chief. And a big door is the cargo compartment door hatch. This aircraft also worked as a cargo plane when needed. The aircraft is number 269 the prefix of 61 means it was built in 1961 and has the 269th airplane and here is an a10 coming in yeah that's part of the base what were you asking about that i said this is a big plane because it has to hold, hold oh yeah us. there's an upper deck mm -hmm or actually forward body which is a tank just below just above the uh, the wheel the wheels there front wheels or in that area then there's upper body which is right below the cargo hatch then there's center wing which goes covers a fuselage underneath the wing and part way up into each wing then there's a wing tank, and then you have on the outside of the number one and number four engine is a tip tank. And then towards the back you have aft body, and then on top they call it upper deck, which is basically there's a wall on the end of the fuselage on the inside, and that's actually the outside of the fuel tank. So this is a flying gas can. F-101B This is my favorite fighter of all times. This is the F-4. You see these little white rectangular shapes those are lighted panels here you can see the one over the wings and the one underneath the cockpit these things would light, light up and you can see them in dusk as a real pretty sight this was your workhorse fighter in Vietnam Now when we refueled these, they'd have a series of four to five. One would fly over the top of the KC-135, one would be on the bottom of it, one on the left wing, one on the right wing, and one getting fuel. 
and they just do a little rotation. Those big red things, those are the engine plugs. Keeps foreign objects out of the inside of the engines. This is an F-105. Another workhorse during Vietnam. Primarily between 1965 and 1968. This is a chair of honor for prisoners of war missing in action. Since it's hard to read, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> Our individual freedom and liberty have been won and preserved for us by our military, our sons, our daughters, and generations before us. We will bring you home after the war is a promise our commitment makes to those who serve. This unoccupied chair is a reminder that all have not come home. Our nation's pr prisoners of war, POW and missing in action must have never be forgotten. I apologize for making this video so long. There was just so much to see and I am very partial towards this base. That being said, I hope you enjoyed this look at the Grissom Air Museum. And if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And most of all, thanks for watching.